Good morning, BBC. So great to be with you this morning. I've had a long-standing relationship with BBC. I've had friends who've attended the church over the years and friends who attend the church currently. I have family here. My in-laws are here this morning. Hi, Mom, Dad. Uh, my aunt, uh, Sandy, is on staff here. And then I've had a long relationship with Mike and Buddy through Campus Outreach. In fact, Mike played a pivotal role in me coming to faith and in my faith journey. So it really is an honor and a privilege to be invited to share God's word with you this morning. And somewhere else where it was an honor and a privilege to be invited was to my very first Jewish Shabbat dinner. So a few Fridays ago, we have friends from my daughter's school who had been promising us for a while to have us over for Sabbath dinner, and they finally made it happen. And I remember walking into their house and being so taken aback by the food, that, the fragrance coming out of the kitchen, and just the vibe, the, the table decor, and, and just everyone was so relaxed and friendly. They had extended family there. And then when we, we sat down, just before we sat down to eat, they began their, their Jewish Shabbat traditions. And, and that started off with the priestly blessing in Numbers chapter six being read in Hebrew. And then they sang two Jewish songs and we kind of be, bobbed and weaved a little bit to those. And then they said Kedush, which is a blessing meaning sanctif sanctifying the day of rest. And from the joy around the table, I could see that this was something that they loved doing. You see, most Jewish people take a weekly Sabbath from a Friday evening to a Saturday evening, they take a 24-hour period where they stop their work, where they limit their activity, and where they rest. It's a time for replenishment. It's a time where they get themselves ready for the week to come. It's a time where they resist, they put a stake in the ground and they resist the pressures of society, the demands on us to keep busy. It's a time where they reflect on what's most important in life, where they spend time with, with family, with, with friends. And I could tell on that evening that this was far more than just a ritual. This was the best day of their week. But as I sat there, I felt slightly uncomfortable. Not because I was this Christian boy with a yarmulke on my head, or because I had gone and said, no, look, I've dabbled in a little bit of Hebrew at Bible college, and then they said, oh, that's interesting. Would you mind reciting something from the Hebrew scriptures? And I sat there with a mouthful of teeth. No, that's not why I felt uncomfortable. I felt uncomfortable because I realized that this is not something I practice. That we as a family practice. Look, I, I've been a pastor for a number of years and I take a weekly day off and don't get me wrong, I enjoy that day off. I rest, I do fun things, I, I have hobbies that I enjoy. I might go for a run or watch an episode of Stranger Things, no judging. But work has a way of creeping in. I somehow just find something to do. Maybe it's, you know, checking emails or getting ready for the Sunday to come. But I longed, I longed for what they had. I longed for it. I want this. And I wonder why. Why, why is it that I, I long for this? Why is it that I feel uncomfortable with the way that I do Sabbath? You see, I think it's because Sabbath is God's design. This Sabbath rhythm of work, rest, work, rest, undergirds all of creation. I want you to think about just day and night, for instance. The sun comes up and most living creatures are active, productive, doing their work. And then the sun goes down and it's time to rest. Think about the seasons. Summertime is a, a time of, of fruitfulness. Winter is a time of dormancy. Or the life cycles of many creatures in our world. A caterpillar, I mean, it just chows. Eat, 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 eat. And then what happens? It goes into a cocoon and it just lies waiting, resting for the next period of its life. In fact, we see this rhythm right at the beginning of creation. 
When God himself engages in work, the work of creation, and then what does he do? On the seventh day, he rests. Now, if the living God is engaged in this kind of a rhythm, and if it's intertwined into the fabric of creation, it would be very difficult to argue against the fact that this must just be the right rhythm. It must be good, it must be necessary even for us. But we know that human beings are prone to go against the grain of God's design. And since the beginning of time, even with this principle, have found it difficult to maintain Sabbath. Which is why the Lord commands them in Exodus. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. And it's interesting of all of the Ten Commandments, this is the one that he fleshes out the most, gives the most airtime to. Because we're prone to forgetting. We're prone to ignoring what God has set in place. And as I engage with people who live in Johannesburg, I'm beginning to realize that it's not just me who finds this concept of a complete 24-hour period of rest foreign. Generally speaking, Joe Burgers work hard. Rightfully so. Hard work is a biblical mandate We have responsibilities, we have bills to pay, we have families to care for, we have God-given purposes to fulfill here on earth and we ought to be working hard. In fact, there are times that call for us to do more than what's required. To work into the evening, to work on weekends. But my sense is that it is a pattern amongst Joe Burgers to allow overwork to become more and more regular. We start work earlier and we, go to, we finish the day later. Or it's more and more that we're taking work home on weekends or even on vacation with us. See, I think that there is a deeper problem at play here. It's not overwork. It's not even that we battle to rest. In fact, Today's sermon is not even about any of those things. It's not about work and it's not about Sabbath. The greater issue behind our overwork and our ability or our inability to rest rather is a pandemic that is plaguing us and I call it chronic busyness. Yes? Now, if you're a parent, you've had that moment in your life where you had the privilege of naming your children. And you'll know that at certain times, uh, there are certain names that come into fashion. So maybe it's it's biblical names today and tomorrow it's alternative names or like fruit, like apple or watermelon. No, watermelon's not not a good one. But I want you, I've I've noticed this, this, there's a name in particular at the moment which has become quite popular. And, and, And people seem to even be changing their birth name to this one name. So I'll just give you a window into a typical conversation I might have. Hey there, Jude, how are you doing? I'm busy. Hey there, Delilah, how are you doing? I'm busy. It's, it's funny for me how often we introduce ourselves as busy. Now it's a little joke, but it's not untrue, right? We are busy people, and look, life is busy. Life is overwhelming, man. Living in this city is chaotic. There is a lot going on. There are a lot of demands on us, a lot that is expected. But if we're honest with with ourselves, I think we secretly love it. We love being busy. I know myself. When I have some space, when 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 there's nothing to do, I'll find something to do. I'll scroll on my phone or I'll, I'll fix something or I'll, I'll clean something, I'll do something because I find it very difficult to not be busy, right? So why? Why is it that we struggle so much to stop? Why do we have to be busy all the time? Well, this is my opinion but I believe that because living underneath the surface of all of our lives is a deep-seated 
restlessness. Ronald Rollheiser once said, we are a restless people. And I think that this restlessness exists in our lives because actually deeply we are afraid. And you're like, what? Well, I want you just to have a look at this next image. And this represents our lives. This represents what's going on in all of us. Deep down under the surface of our lives, at the core of our being, are some really nasty things. We live with fear, with anger. Maybe we've been hurt in the past. Or maybe we have guilt and shame that plagues us because there's, there's things in our lives that we've done or we're currently doing that we're just so ashamed of. Or maybe we're insecure about who we are. Or lonely. We just, we're just lonely. We, just, we long for companionship. Or we're anxious. We're so anxious. We worry about everything. We overthink everything. I want you to just put an internal hand up if you've ever felt any of these things. And I, I just feel like I'm not good enough. And I'm not extraordinary enough. I, I'm not successful enough, no matter how hard I work. I, I, don't, feel, I don't feel loved enough. I'm so ashamed if people knew what I'd done, if people know what I'm addicted to. I feel like my relationships are superficial. I feel like my relationships are a mess. I feel so disconnected from God. I come to church on a Sunday, but I just feel like he is so far away. And I think that one of the reasons why we keep ourselves busy is because we're afraid to deal with the restlessness that these things are causing. We're afraid to stop because if we stop, these things are going to float to the surface. We're going to have to deal with them and it's painful. And so it's far easier just to keep working, just to keep busy, just to numb ourselves, just to live with a with mask, Let me be vulnerable with you. One of the reasons why I find it so difficult to stop is because when I stop for long enough, the anxiety in my head becomes overwhelming. Overwhelming. I worry about everything. So I don't like to stop because I know, then I know I'm gonna worry. At least if I'm focused in, on something or doing something, then you know, it, just, it gets stored away somewhere. So to summarize, we're busy as people largely because we're restless and we're restless because we're afraid of dealing with it. So I'd love to share with you this morning about a character in the Bible, someone that we know, we've, we've, we've heard the story, but I'd love for us just to dig a little bit into this character this morning because I think what we'll find is that she's just like us. She lives with this restlessness and she hides behind her work. So let's turn to Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to read from verse 38 about the story of Martha. So as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, unfortunately, this passage has been misinterpreted many times. 
Because in fact, this passage is not a dig at hard work, as if working hard is unspiritual and sitting and have a long quiet time with Jesus is the most spiritual thing you can do. That's not what this passage teaches. It's not even taking a dig at Martha's work of hosting, as if in that moment she should have been hosting Jesus, she should have just been you know, spending time with Jesus. Like hosting is a bad thing. In fact, I think what, what Martha's doing is very honorable. She's opening, opening her home to Jesus. She wants to be a good host. She wants to make sure that Jesus is comfortable. Lord, can I get you a cappuccino, maybe a latte? Um, why don't you take that seat over there, Lord? That, that's a nice, comfortable seat. I'll bring out some starters in the meantime. Do you want some background music? Maybe a bit of Ed Sheeran, or maybe you're more into classical. I don't know. You just let me know. I think, though, what this passage is highlighting is Martha's response. Because I think her response gives us a glimpse into what's really going on in her heart. And it's this that Jesus is concerned about. Let's just look at verse 40 again. I'm gonna read it again from verse 40. I just want you to notice. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her, tell her to help me. And just the Lord's gentle response, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So what we know is that Martha is distracted. And that's not bad. She's distracted with good things. She's hosting Jesus well. But Jesus sees right through it. Just like, you know, that Samaritan woman at the well where she has all these things and he just sees right through it. And he goes to the heart and he says, but Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. You're restless, Martha. And her response tells us that she's, the many things that she's worried and upset about it is, it can't just be that Jesus is okay. We pick up a deeper insecurity that is going on in this lady's life. I, I'm convinced that she's overly focused on her work. It's almost as if she's found her worth in her ability to please Jesus, to make sure that he's happy and comfortable, and that if she fails at this task, she's gonna feel like a failure. Hey, I wouldn't be surprised if she has based her entire relationship with God on this transactional way of living. Hey, I'll make sure that I serve you well, God, and you'll be happy with me, and I'll feel okay about myself. But if I drop the ball and I'm gonna bash myself because I failed. And I mean, this is what society was like. It was a law-based religious society that wasn't made any easier by the Pharisees. And as a woman in that society, your job was to not be seen, you stay in the kitchen, you make sure that everything is fine. This woman is probably craving worth. And the way that she can get that is to make sure that she does her job as a woman well, and then she'll be loved and noticed. But her insecurity is beginning to impact on other people. Look at the assumption that she makes of Mary. Like what Mary's doing is wrong. Like, how dare you go and sit and be with Jesus? There's work to be done, sister. She assumes that what she's doing is right. And she even assumes that Jesus is gonna agree with her. Tell, tell my sister. She needs to come help me. Hey, yeah? She's jealous. Oh, Mary's got a day off. Like her. She avoids conflict. Instead of going to her sister and saying, hey, Mary, do you mind if we just have an offline chat quickly? I just want to talk to you about something. I I just feel like we've got Jesus in our home and and I really would love for us just to serve him well. Would you mind helping me? What does she do? She gets Jesus to come and have a little chat with her in the kitchen. 
Can you sort out my sister, please? I mean, imagine you came to my home for dinner. And there my wife is, she's sitting at the table having a great time talking to you. And I'm slaving, look, it's always the opposite way, but I'm slaving in the kitchen. You know, I, I'm making sure everyone's happy. I'm getting drinks. I'm, I'm, I'm running around. And then instead of like pulling my wife aside and saying, I need a bit of help, I ask you to come and have a little chat with me on the side. Can you tell my wife to help me make sure that you're okay? I mean, that would be so awkward. It's ridiculous. And that's what... That's what Martha's doing. But look at, look at the way that Jesus responds to her. He sees her. He sees right through her. He's not demanding to be served. He doesn't get all upset and throw a fuss. He just sim simply points out, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. And you actually need only one thing today. I'm inviting you to come and spend some time with me. To stop. To stop your work. Because what you really need, Martha, is you need to see that restlessness inside of you. Kent Hughes, commentator, says that Martha did not realize that at that critical time in Jesus' life, he would have preferred her company over her service and that he regarded her fellowship with him as more important than serving him a meal. Jesus is inviting Martha into relationship with him. That is what he really wants and that is what she really needs. And he doesn't just want to have relationship with this dear lady and leave her in her restlessness. He wants to be the one who heals her, who redefines her, who gives her her sense of worth. He wants her to be freed from the lies that she believes about God and about herself, about the way that the world works. He wants to give her the truth that's gonna do that for her. And as you sit here this morning, BBC, I know we can read the Bible and it can sometimes feel so far removed from us. But how are we any different to Martha? I mean, let's just get honest here. We're broken. All of us. We come to church. We, we, we act spiritual. But we are hurting. We really are. There's stuff going on in our lives. And we, we wear masks and we find things to just keep it at bay so we don't have to deal with that stuff. And Jesus is inviting us to take time out to sit and be with him so that he can go there with us. He doesn't want to show us those things to shame us. He wants to show us those things so that he can love us there, receive us there, pour out his unending rich grace on us there in that place. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. This is an invite to all of us. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and anxious and ashamed and fearful and hurting. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. This is not just talking about physical rest. You will find rest for the restlessness in your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, Jesus is offering us rest for our souls, but it's found in a transaction, in an exchange. Jesus is saying, you come with your stuff, and you come and you give it to me. You share it with me, and you let me carry it, and I want to give you my light yoke. And my light yoke is peace. 
It's peace in your restlessness. And that peace comes about as he speaks his gospel truths of peace into our sin, into our mess, into our brokenness. And as we take that truth and we stand on it and we believe it and we make choices in line with that, man, it fills us with peace. I want you just to imagine being courageous enough to go and sit with Jesus and to face stuff that you don't want to face. I did this, Lord, a few years ago. and I still carry around the guilt. No one knows. Lord, I just feel so depressed. God, my family is a mess. My marriage is a mess. I hate my job. Just got to do it. God, I feel like you are so far away. You feel like this concept, this God in the sky. I feel angry at you, Lord. We can say that to God. I feel angry. You took my dad away. We can be real. And there in that place, imagine him saying, I know. (laughs) I get it. I see you. And I love you there. You think you're unworthy. You're worthy to me. I died for you. You feel lonely. I want you to know I'm with you. You feel like you are worried about the future. I want you to know that I'm in control of your life. And we sang about it. My arms are big enough to carry you. And I made a promise that when I start working in someone's life, I finish it. I will finish the work that I've started in you. Imagine what Martha would have been like as an individual if she had done this regularly with God. If if she had worked from a place of security, she would be free. It wouldn't matter so much whether Mary was helping her or not in the kitchen. It wouldn't matter so much whether Jesus is perfectly at home here in her house. It would be okay for her just to come and sit and be with him. Imagine, imagine what it would do for us, BBC, if we lived like this. Where we work not out of fear, but we work from a place of freedom where we're free to be a gift to society, a gift to other people. Or in our relationships, we're not leeches sucking the life out of the other person. We can be a gift because, man, my worth doesn't come from you. My worth comes from who God says I am. I'm his son, I'm his daughter, and I'm free to love because I'm loved. Imagine the intimacy that is possible in our relationship with Jesus who says in John 15, I wanna abide. I want you to abide with me to remain in my love in this intimate space of relationship with me all the time. I would just love to tell you, just give you a window into part of my story and how this is beginning to change for me as I'm doing the hard work of facing it with God. I grew up with a wonderful father He was an incredibly present dad. At all of our cricket matches, he came home from work, he would prioritize time with my brother and I. He loved us, he wrestled with us on the couch, he was affectionate with us in public, kisses and affirming us, I love you my son, I'm proud of you. He was my hero, and then when I was 16 years old, my dad got home from work and him and my mom sat us down, called us to their bedroom and said we're separating. And dad left that day and he never came back. And I found out that he was an alcoholic and that he had been hiding it and he had made other destructive choices in his life and he lost his job and the relationship just started to change. And we both tried, but it just, there was just something in the way there and the distance grew. And I began to, to think about God in this way. Well, God, you're gonna bail on me. Like, how do I really believe? You can tell me you love me, but my dad did that and then he left. So how can I trust you, God? How can I I view you as a father? And the Bible calls you father, talks about you in that way, but I I struggle with that concept. 
And I avoided talking about it for years. And then God called me to stop, to take time, to allow those things to come to mind and to speak them out to him. And as I began to do that and the tears flowed and it was the most painful thing, God began to speak to me. My son, I'm not like your earthly father. I'm never gonna leave you. I'm not gonna let you down. And he showed me that he's a good, good dad. And I'm growing in that knowledge where it's moving from the point of, of, yeah, I get it as a concept, but it's moving to a place of felt reality here in my heart. But that only comes about, these kinds of things only come about when we are willing to take the time to stop. So I wanna bring it back to Sabbath. Why are we, what, what's Sabbath got to do with any, anything? Well, Sabbath is a spiritual discipline where we force ourselves to stop. And I'm not giving, this sermon is not a definition of Sabbath. I'm not talking about elaborating on what Sabbath should be. All I'm saying is that imagine if we just took a piece of a day off of a Sabbath where we sat and we dealt with our stuff with Jesus. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Lord, I want you just to show me what's going on for me. Show me the things about myself that I don't wanna see, that I'm unable to see. Show me them so that I can hand those burdens over to you and I can hear you speak your peace, your light burden to me. And God may lead you to a passage of scripture or a truth, a gospel truth that is gonna resonate with your heart. And then you just make choices around that. I choose to believe that this is true. And I would even encourage you to do something. I, I know I struggle with just having a week you know, Sabbath to Sabbath, it's difficult for me to last that long. So I've started implementing micro Sabbaths in my day. We're in the morning and at midday during my lunch break, sometimes even before I go to sleep, I'll stop and I'll, I'll talk to the Lord about the things that are going on for me. Often during the morning of work, there's so much that's triggered anxiety in me that I have to sit and I have to talk to Jesus about it. And then I just do that same thing, Lord, what do you want me to know in this place? Hey, you want me to know you're in control. You want me to know that your peace is available to me. So I choose that with you, Lord. So that's my encouragement to you. And we're gonna just take some time now to just be still and in a sense, practice this. And I'm aware that it's a difficult space. There's a lot of us here, but just on your own, I'm just gonna ask us to be still before the Lord, quieten ourselves and ask God to bring things to the surface that need to be dealt with with him. So why don't you do that? And I, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that where there's that little voice in us that's keeping those things shoved down, that you would give us the courage to face our fear. I pray that you would help us to see what you see And I pray that in that place, Lord, you would, you would really love us there. In those broken, hurting places that you would really touch us. Affirm us, Lord. And that it would resonate with our hearts. Please just allow us to connect to those truths today. I want to pray for this people, Lord, your people. Who you know by name. You love so deeply. I pray you bring healing Lord, to them. forgiveness, confidence, dependence on you, faith, grace upon grace.